first webinar of 2019 um, in our series, Network Leadership Lessons from the Field. Um, we are so pleased that you're here. This is Danielle Varda. I am the CEO of Visible Network Labs and an Associate Professor at the Center on Network Science at the University of Colorado, Denver. And um, this webinar series is co-hosted between the two organizations, the Center on Network Science and Visible Network Labs. So we're just um, pleased everyone is, is here today to join us. Um, we wanted to start by just um, giving a little bit of background on Visible Network Labs and what we do. Um, we run a platform called Aspen, which is a social connectedness platform. We are the home of the partner tool, which a lot of folks um, we think in our audiences might be familiar with, um, and also the person-centered network app. Um, and we have a lot of ways that we try to connect people to resources and build skills and capacity and communities for doing network leadership work. We do that through our learning lab, which is part of this webinar series, um, our connected communities lab, which will be up in um, online in just a few days, and um, our kind of in-community work that we do. Um, we also just wanted to make sure that we didn't forget to highlight our Network Leadership Training Academy in Denver. It's our seventh year, and it brings together community members from all over the country for three days in a really um, kind of intimate and fun environment for learning. So if you like this kind of stuff that our speaker Stephanie is going to be talking about today, and you want more of it, this is a great home for someone like you, and we just love um, expanding that network as many ways as we can, so be sure to check that out. Um, just a couple of things, I don't want to get too in the weeds of how we think about things, but we are um, a network science-based um, group, so all of the work we do is based on these concepts of network science um, and ways of thinking about connecting to one another, building partnerships and collaboration that uses approaches um, like the strength of weak ties, for example, um, that basically thinks about um, network building as maybe more is not better, when should we collaborate um, and act in different ways and build different structures. So our network leadership work is really meant to um, think about those kinds of ideas and different ways of connecting. And so we kind of try to get out of the rut that more is always better and really take a critical and, um, eye and try to understand um, ways we can do that work better. Um, we offer all these tools like Partner to do that kind of work um, and lots of different ways to see data and understand it in our data dashboard. So we just wanted to highlight some of the things that we're doing in that way and um, you know we want to make sure that you have a connection to the bigger picture um, as we get into the more nuanced um, work of network leadership. So just a couple of slides here before we get Started. Um, we do this webinar series because we know that folks today are out there working in um, what we call the network way of working. It's pretty common that those of us who are in any job actually today are being asked to think about working across sectors, the advantage of connecting to one another, and it's hard work and we don't often get a lot of space and time in our day to figure out how to do that. Um, because it's networking and connecting, I think there's a big assumption that because um, we're human, we should know how to do that. And the truth is, uh, social connectedness varies in so many ways. And getting a visibility on that very invisible way of, of working together is something we're hoping to help other people do. Um, we do manage um, a framework, or we do uh, we are informed, guided by a framework called Build uh, for Network Leadership that's structured around building, managing, and evaluating effective networks. And we have a lot of different ways of thinking about each of those categories. And just like networks, our thinking on this is dynamic, and we learn from people like you as we go through it. So um, what you're seeing there on the right is some of our testing of our own assumptions that the things that we think are important in network leadership are important to people and that we might be able to provide content through webinars or the Network Leadership Training Academy or other learning lab activities that Um, our network leadership framework is really guided by these seven core values. So every speaker we have in our webinar series fits into these core values, um, both we think as people 
and also on the work that they're doing. Um, so not to get into too much detail, but um, we believe that network leadership should be inclusive, and by that we mean it's not just for the backbone organization or the manager of the network, but network leadership is a skill and a capacity um, that everyone in the network should be able to have access to. Um, so whether you're a citizen participating or the manager. Um, we believe that network leadership needs to be community and culturally sensitive. We don't think any two networks are alike, so we will never give you the list of the seven things you should do for every network. We just don't believe that networks in Baltimore are similar to networks in Denton, Texas. And so we hope to give you skills and advice and ways of thinking that you can adapt to the things that make it really community and culturally sensitive. Um, of course, our work is relationship-focused, skill-based, um, and the last three on the bottom are really going to, um, you're really going to resonate with this after you hear Stephanie speak today. Um, it's re we believe that network leadership should be data driven, um, that assumptions and strategies and action steps should be informed by understanding of things. So whether it's a network analysis or a qualitative research project um, or just stories that people in our networks tell, we believe that we should pause to use time and use, get data to inform that and be really reflective in what we learn and, and then adapt our networks based on what we're hearing. So we are not necessarily trying to come out with um, the best data points and um, the best practices for everyone. What we're trying to do is um, co build capacity around a way of working in um, a network leadership framework. Um, so those are our goals. Uh, our team over here is um, really strong in these areas and always thinking every day on how to take these values and integrate them into all of the work that we do. Um, last announcement, um, our next uh, webinar in our series will be February 21st, um, 10 a.m. Mountain Time. Uh, we are very excited that Jeff, Dr. Jeff Kerr, the Executive Director of Mesa County Public Health, has agreed to join us in the next webinar on building social connectedness in neighborhoods. Um, they're doing amazing work on the western slope of Colorado around building social connectedness um, in neighborhoods with the schools, elementary schools, as the uh, focal point. So just amazing, innovative work on that, and I think you'll really love to hear him speak. Now to today's webinar, um, I'm really pleased to introduce Stephanie Bolsema, who is a senior research scientist at Visible Network Lab and also a PhD candidate, uh, candidate at the University of Colorado Denver in the Centra Network Science. Um, we've had the pleasure to know Stephanie um, after she attended one of our Network Leadership Training Academies and then um, reached out and, and we've been able to really accomplish some amazing things. She has was the co-founder, is the co-founder and um, director of our Network Science Fellowship Program that we ran first last summer for 10 mostly PhD students to learn network science. Um, and when Stephanie brought her skills to our team and the work that we're doing, she brought with her a ton of experience from working in the state of Washington with local public health systems there looking at regional health systems using network approaches. And she has just brought a huge capacity to our team um, in these different ways, and we are very excited to share that today. So we're going to um, switch it over to Stephanie um, talking, but we want to take a little bit of a different approach on this. We decided this is um, not your same old webinar, um, <laughs> because we happen to be a team that's really conversational and transparent. And we think that one of the coolest things about setting up a webinar series is getting to meet people who are just doing really cool things in network science and network leadership and social connectedness all around the world. And that's been something that really motivates and drives our team to, to push forward. Um, and we wanted to share a little of that backstory with you all and on the thing that we get to see. So before Stephanie presents, um, we thought it would be really fun to do a really short kind of Q&A with her um, so you can know a little bit more about her. So good morning, Stephanie. Good morning, Danielle. Good morning, everyone on the line. Um, so we're just going to ask Stephanie three questions to give you some background so that when she goes through a presentation, you'll probably get a little more context for understanding. Um, so the first question that we have for you, Stephanie, is really what's your backstory on your entry into networks? How did you get interested in it? Sure. So I first got interested in networks in about 2012. I was working with a collective 
impact initiative in Spokane, Washington, um, called Accelerate Success, which was an education focused collective impact initiative. And um, at the time, I was a research assistant in the data center at the Spokane Regional Health District and acting as data manager for this collective impact initiative. And one of the challenges that we ran into is how do we measure the collaboration side of this work? How do we, when we talk about um, changing the education system in Spokane County, when we talk about cross-sector collaboration, how do we do this from a data-driven perspective? And my manager at the time, Stacey Wenzel, had just seen a presentation somewhere on network analysis, and I was talking with her about this problem, and she said, well, you know, I, I learned about this thing. Maybe it can help. And so my journey with network science and analysis started in 2012 to meet the needs of a collective impact initiative. So that is a perfect launch for my next question. So then how did you actually learn network analysis? Who are your teachers? Uh, well, <laughs> I don't know the I, answer. <laughs> I know, so Danielle does not actually know the answer to this. The, I suppose the, the starting point for this answer is that I am a huge nerd and I thought that it was amazing. And um, I started, I mean, I bought textbooks, I read all the articles I could get my hands on, I took a, an online course from the University of Michigan on social network analysis, and I really, over the next year, kind of um, taught myself network analysis and network science. And I was fortunate enough to have a, um, a way to use what I was learning and kind of implement what I was learning through all these different sources. Um, but I will note that I got to the point where um, I didn't really know if what I knew was valid. And so that's where the Network Leadership Training Academy came in, mm -hmm. as far as coming to the um, to NLTA to see, you know, is does, does what I've been learning actually make sense? And that's where I connected with Danielle and the next phase of my journey began. <laughs> and Stephanie tells a good story because I think all of us struggle at the beginning of a network um, uh, interest with trying to figure out how to learn it. And so I know I did as well. And I think that it's been um, fun to work with you on building capacity for other people. My last question for you, how did you end up in Spokane, Washington and that community? So I started, I kind of started out in Spokane, Washington. Um, my so that's uh, one of the places I grew up. And so I, when I could decide, when I was old enough to decide where I wanted to live, that's where I decided I wanted to live. And I began working at the Spokane Regional Health District in 2011. Um, and I got involved with um, the, the health system there and the Accountable Communities for Health because they were being implemented during my time at the Spokane Regional Health District in the data center. And so I got to kind of see the, the health system transformation process from the ground up. And by that point, I had um, learned how to do network analysis and had been working with um, collective impact initiatives and different um, systems. And so I was able to quickly identify like, oh yes, we. I, I, I know something we could try out here. Awesome. Yeah. Good. And you can imagine there are even so many more stories that Stephanie could tell, and um, we won't have time for those, but they're, they're pretty amazing. So Stephanie is probably as accessible as we are. Um, um, I, I'm, I'm offering you out for, so stay connected um, with, with Stephanie and um, the work that she's doing after you hear her speak. So I'm going to turn it over entirely to you now so that you can uh, share with us this awesome presentation. We are really grateful that you agreed to do this today. All right. All right, everyone. So um, again, my name is Stephanie Boltzma. And to start off, I would like to um, do a quick poll this is just so we can all get a sense of who's on the line. Um, most specifically, I'm interested in with which sector you're most closely associated and how familiar you are, you are with network analysis. So we will get the poll up in just a minute. Okay. Yeah, sorry. It looks like there's a little logistics issue with getting the poll up. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna move forward for now. 
Um, but that will, once we get that pull up, that will help me to understand how, how much I should explain in some of these areas and how much I can kind of just go through. Um, so what I'm going to talk with you all about today is first some background on this work, then a really quick review of network analysis, um, an overview of the health system study in Eastern Washington um, conducted in 2017, and then some considerations for designing a, an effective health system. So starting off with some background here. This work was conducted in 2017 with the Spokane Regional Health District and Better Health Together. And one of the, at least I feel an important thing to understand about this work, is that this was a joint effort between these two organizations and a whole team of people. So even though I'm telling you about it today, um, all of these people and more were involved in making this study happen. Um, so these, these amazing people also deserve all of the credit. Um, the problem that we were trying to address was the mandate to transform the U.S. health system um, as required by the Affordable Care Act. So this created just the very basic problem of, well, what does our health system even look like? What do we mean when we're saying health system? So we ended up adopting the World Health Organization's definition of health system, which is consisting of all organizations, people, and actions, whose primary interest is to promote, restore, or maintain health. And even more specifically, we ended up looking at the health system as an inner organizational network. Now to understand that perspective, it might be helpful to get a little background on where public health is currently at. So some of you may be familiar with the Public Health 3.0 framework. This framework has become very popular in the last few years. And what it does is shows how um, or where public health is really focusing its efforts right now. And so if you look on the right-hand side at Public Health 3.0, you'll see that right now, the, um, the focus in public health is engaging organizations and communities across sectors to achieve broad-based um, population health. And a large reason for this is because people in the health sector have come to understand that we cannot achieve the kind of health improvement that we would like to see without addressing the social determinants of health. These are the things like your education, um, where you live, um, what your income is like, all of these things that factor into your chances of living a healthy life. And so because, the, because improving the social determinants of health means engaging schools, and community-based organizations and the public sector. This is where we start to see the need for collaboration for organizations from all different sectors working together toward this common goal of improving population health. So this is where it starts to become evident why we need, um, why we need network analysis. So this is, when we look at how do we assess systems and measure relationships in these um, cross-sector partnerships, what, where do we even begin? Okay, so it looks like we have our poll well, I'm not sure. Can you up and that? running, perhaps. Yeah. I yeah. think so. It, okay, okay, we got the poll up and running. So if you would actually take a minute to respond to this poll, this will be super helpful as we move forward. So there should be two questions that you see here. First, about your sector, and then second, about um, your familiarity with network analysis. We do one at a time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it looks like so far, most people are associated with either the health sector or public government sector. Very good. I'll show the results here. All right, so most people are familiar with the health sector. So that is helpful. I won't go too much into a lot of the health-related stuff. Okay. And then 
Now this next one, familiarity with network analysis. This will help me to understand how, actually how much I should go into this very next section that we're about to go into. Awesome people all over the place. Yep, all over the place. So we have, it looks like we have a lot of people who are somewhat familiar. So I will, I'll provide a few extra details in these next couple of slides just to um, make sure that everyone is on somewhat equal footing. So poll ended, there are our results. So it looks like we have as many people who are not at all familiar as extremely familiar. So I'll opt toward oversharing on these next couple of slides. All right, so when we look at this, um, this need for cross-sector collaboration, this need for all types of organizations to be working together in a structured way, this gets us to the question of how do we go about taking a data-driven approach to that? And this gets back to the question that I was trying to figure out um, several years ago when first working with that collective impact initiative. And so network analysis is one way that we can go about assessing systems and measuring relationships. Um, network analysis is any structured technique used to mathematically analyze a network or system, um, and it can be applied in a bunch of different ways. So network analysis can be applied to organizational networks or inner organizational networks. Um, it could be applied to biological networks in your body, your brain. It can be applied in information technology networks or gas pipelines. You know, so there are all of these different applications for how you can use network analysis. This is the primary mode of inquiry used in network science, um, the discipline of network science. And many of you may be familiar with social network analysis. So this is network analysis applied to um, social relationships, essentially. So the next thing to understand about network analysis is that there are kind of two primary components to network analysis, just as any other type of data analysis. So the first is, and what you may be really familiar with or have seen before, is these network maps that you see over on the right-hand side. Um, and these are super useful, first because they can be really pretty, and people like them, they like looking at them, they respond well to them generally. But you can also, just by looking at these maps and nothing else, you can start to see a picture of what's going on with these networks. So you can see here, you know, from 2009 to 2012, um, the quantity of relationships has increased, more of these nodes, so those dots are called nodes, um, oftentimes these nodes are more connected. So you can actually tell a fair amount just by looking at these maps. But when we start to get into the territory of how do you evaluate a network over time, and how do you, you know, really understand the granular aspects of a network, this is where you really need to pull in those network statistics. And this is um, the area where people who are less familiar with network analysis um, might not know quite as much. And so, Anytime you see a network map like this, it, there is a possibility that it is accompanied by network statistics, or it potentially could be if you had the right data. And so these statistics operate at two different levels, really. So the first is structural met metrics, where you're looking at the whole network, the entire network. And these are things where you can see how dense the network is, um, how far apart um, nodes in the network are, things like that. And then you can also look at individual metrics. This is where you begin to get an understanding of the individual people or organizations within the network. Um, these are you know, metrics where you can understand the relative importance of a node in the network or um, how it's positioned in the network in relation to all of the other nodes. So that is just a, I mean, just brief high-level overview of network analysis, but um, there's lots more information out there if you're interested in getting a better understanding. So now that we all have a, a baseline understanding of network analysis, I wanna hop into the study overview, or an overview of the study conducted with Spokane Regional Health District and Better Health Together in Eastern Washington. 
So this is um, all about, or it's kind of started because of the implementation of the Accountable Community for Health model. So this is a model that has been implemented in four states across the U.S. and it is in response to that mandate to transform health systems. Um, now each of these states breaks their um, state up into ACH regions and in Eastern Washington we're focusing on the Better Health Together region. That is that light purple region in the upper right hand corner of Washington state there. Now, for most of these regions, an ACH organization was created to help coordinate this huge cross-sector effort that has been undertaken to um, transform the regional health system. And so in Eastern Washington and the Better Health Together region, an ACH organization was created specifically for this purpose, which is also called Better Health Together. So in this region where Better Health Together or BHT acts as the coordinating entity, um, this region covers six counties and three tribal nations. It's home to about 600,000 people and it covers both urban and rural areas. For this study, we addressed several research questions. Um, the first and most basic of which being, what does our health system even look like? When we say we're going to transform our health system, what does that mean? What are we talking about here? Um, we also wanted to figure out where is the health system focusing its efforts and which organizations are key participants in the system. Um, furthermore, how do those organizations interact with one another? And then how do subsystems differ by sector, geographic service area, and linkage type. So we're gonna dig into each one of these just a bit so you get a sense of what it means to assess a health system. Um, so the methods used for this study were survey data collection. The sample um, included 564 organizations, which included over 9,000 unique partnerships among those organizations and over 17,000 total linkages. So that's including all five types of relationships that we measured. Um, we bound the network using a three-phase snowball sampling approach um, and ended up with a 34% survey response rate. Um, we used a variety of tools for data collection, analysis, and visualization, including SNAP survey, GEFI, data, ArcGIS Online, and PictoCharts. So what did we find out when we um, did this investigation of what does our health system even look like? The first thing is that this is what Eastern Washington's health system looked like in 2017. So each of those dots that you see are it represent an organization. Um, the organizations or those nodes are colored by sector. And the size of those nodes um, represents how many reports that organization had from other organizations um, that they had some sort of relationship. So the larger nodes had more organizations saying that they worked with that organization. So this is just a beginning starting point for this is what the health system looks like. From there, we wanted to find out, we wanted to learn more about specific relationships in the system. So we um, asked questions about collaboration, referral, data exchange, education, and financial support, and how these organizations um, had these types of relationships on issues relating to health in the region. System, but it allowed us to start looking at these subsystems, um, in this case, by the specific linkage types. When I say linkage type, that's the type of relationship, so collaboration, referral, et cetera. And this started to give us some really interesting information to help us understand how organizations worked with one another across the region. We could also do some cool things with this kind of information, such as looking at a more granular um, in a more granular sense at who's sending data to other organizations versus who's receiving data from other organizations. And so this 
breaking down the subsystem by linkage type allowed us to do some really um, cool and uh, specific type of assessments for the relationships in the region. From there, we were also interested in looking at how do these subsystems differ by geographic service area. And so not only were we able to see how do organizations in these specific service areas work with one another, but it also enabled us to look at how do organizations across counties work with one another. And then another thing we're really interested in was this cross-sector collaboration aspect. And so here we identified, um, or we had each organization categorized by one of five sectors, social, health, public education, or business. And this allowed us to look at not only how organizations collaborated with one another across sectors, but also how organizations worked within their own sector on issues related to health. And so it was really cool to see that, you know, the public sector, the education sector, the business sector, and especially the, the social sector, all of those lines between each one of those dots is a relationship that's maintained between organizations in just that one sector on issues related to health. So this starts to paint the picture of um, the health system really going far beyond just the health sector. Um, this also enabled us to look at, you know, specific cross-sector linkages. So here, these, each of these network maps is showing how the health sector specifically works with other sectors. So how it works with the social sector, the public sector, education and business sectors on issues related to health. So that was an example of how network analysis can be used to assess a health system, to really start to understand what's going on with that system. Um, but one of the things that I really struggled with when we conducted this study in 2017 was figuring out, okay, beyond working with the community and um, using these results to identify areas for improvement, what does this mean from a more theoretical perspective? And so, um, because I very much agree with Danielle that, you know, all, all networks are different, they have their own considerations and you must be cognizant of those, I'm framing these, this next section as considerations. Um, so these considerations are derived from the public affairs and health policy literature. And um, they're really just things to think about when you are working to transform a health system or a collective impact network, um, things that you can keep in your back pocket and think about as you are moving forward with this work. But before we get into those three considerations, I think it's really important to call out community and the role that community plays in each one of these considerations. Um, so having the community involved throughout the process is really the only way that you're going to achieve equity, diversity, and useful centrality in any health system, which is what we're about to talk about. Um, so I'll come back to this, but keep this in mind that at the center of each one of these considerations is the community in which you are working. It's the community that your health system is designed to serve. So the first one is diversity. We know that collaborative networks addressing a broad problem set should have diverse member representation. So one way to look at this here is by who responded to the health system survey versus who is represented in that sample, the full health system that we were able to bound. And we see here that there was over-representation in the health and education sector um, or over participation versus representation. Um, and then when we look at geographic service area, so who responded to the survey versus where, where organizations are actually located, we saw that many more people in Spokane County, the largest county in the region, responded to the survey, um, whereas many fewer people in some of the more rural counties responded. Um, so what this could mean is that um, the, you know, we ideally want the diversity of participation to represent the population. And by looking at these charts helps us to get an initial sense 
of where diversity um, could potentially be increased to um, create a more effective system. The next thing to consider is equity. So we know that ensuring equitable representation of historically underrepresented groups is a vital component for a successful health system. One way to look at this is looking at Eastern Washington's health system geographically oriented. And just from an initial glance at this map, you can see a couple of things. So the first thing is, um, again, these nodes are sized by how often other organizations pointed to them, saying that they worked with them. And that is, in a way, a measure of power. Um, how, how much they're known, how, how much collaborative capacity these organizations have. And you can see that three counties out of the six have, a, um, have at least one relatively powerful organization residing in that county. Um, the areas that are outlined in yellow are the tribal nations. And so we see that in three counties and, three, and all three tribal nations that there are no relatively powerful organizations. The equity challenge that this kind of thing could present is um, better health together really needing to go out of their way to ensure that resources are equitably distributed throughout the region, not just to those counties with very well-known and integrated organizations. And then also things just like um, involvement, making sure that organizations in these areas are equ equitably involved and that information is distributed to each of these areas where there may not be as powerful an advocate um, residing in that area. Another way that we can look at this is by looking at the, um, the health system or the sample compared to the composition of the Better Health Together Board of Directors. So the blue bars in each of these charts are the um, proportion of the sample, the overall health system, that um, falls into each one of these groups. And then the gray bars are the composition of the board of directors in 2017 and 2018. And as you'll see here, if we look by geographic service area, each one of the six counties is underrepresented proportionately on the board of directors. Um, tribal organizations are overrepresented as are regional organizations. So regional organizations being and um, those organizations that work across multiple counties throughout the region. When we look at, look at this by sector, we see a similar kind of story. Um, every one of the sectors, except for health, is proportionately underrepresented on the board of directors. And the health sector is um, significantly overrepresented. So this starts to get at the picture of when we're looking at how do we make sure that the decisions that are being made by this coordinating entity um, are representative of all of the geographic service areas, the counties, the tribal nations throughout the region, not just, um, say, the largest city in the region, and then also that the needs of each of these sectors are being accounted for, not just the health sector. Finally, we should consider centrality. So we know that health systems with coordinating entities such as Better Health Together that have high centrality are associated with better outcomes. So this is the network map that you see is just the collaboration network. So if you recall, we had five different types of relationships. We're just looking at collaboration here. The orange dot in the center is Better Health Together. And each one of these um, nodes are sized by n degrees. So again, how many times other organizations point into that organization. So according to the um, literature on, much of the literature on network administration, um, we would ideally want to see Better Health Together be one of the, if not the most, central organization on matters related to health throughout the region. Um, we see that there are several other organizations that in 2017 were more central than Better Health Together. Now, I'm really interested to see how this has changed 
because this was really shortly after Better Health Together was created. And so I, I'm actually pretty impressed that they have this amount of centrality um, so early on in the life of this organization. Um, but so thinking about how central the coordinating entity is, is another way to think about how to design an effective health system. So to recap those considerations, um, the first thing is always remember the importance of involving your community, remembering that this system is being designed for your community, therefore the community should be at the center of, um, of all that you do in designing the system. From there, um, remembering to consider diversity. And this could mean engaging, intentionally engaging underrepresented groups in the design, implementation, and evaluation of the system. Then um, keeping a mind toward equity. This could mean inviting marginalized counties or sectors to decision-making tables and ensuring that resources are equitably distributed, perhaps across sectors, um, but definitely across geographic service areas if you're working with a, um, it, with a regional scope. And then finally, um, the importance of centrality when you're talking about a new or emerging system. And so when this comes to what, how, what Better Health Together could potentially do to increase their centrality in the system, um, this could mean connecting with diverse organizations throughout the region. So what is next with this work? Um, we are, I'm very excited to announce that we will be repeating this study this year. We will be specifically looking at what's changed in the system since 2017. Where are there opportunities for improving care coordination? This will be a kind of new focus that we're adding in. And then also, how have network interventions that have been implemented by Better Health Together or others in Eastern Washington changed the health system? Um, and finally, on a, on a personal note, I will be focusing my dissertation next year on looking at collaboration and accountable communities for health. So I will be continuing on this work um, in, in many different ways over the next couple of years. So thank you all so much for taking the time to um, participate in this webinar today and for your interest in this topic. Feel free to reach out to me with any questions you have, anything you'd like to talk about. I've included some key references here, um, but if you need access to any of those articles or have any other, um, anything else you want to reach out for, please don't hesitate. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Now I'm going to hand it over to Danielle. Oh, Stephanie, thank you. This is the second time I've seen Stephanie present this, and I've learned both times. So, so excited about your work, and um, you all can see what I mean by Stephanie just uh, upped our game, brought all kinds of capacity uh, to our team when she came over to Colorado. <laughs> um, and as you can see, the folks in Washington weren't really ready to let her go, because they've got <laughs> she's going to work with them on their time, too. Um, so we have a couple of questions from people um, on the webinar. So if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat um, right now, and um, we'll see if we can get through them all. Um, so this slide might help with one of the questions. So um, there's a question about your citation for, um, oh, sorry. Uh, can you share the citation for the paper on coordinating entities that are most central, that when coordinating entities have most, <laughs> that are more central have better outcomes? Yeah, so the one I'll direct your attention to specifically, Oh my, it looks like my um, citations went a little weird. But so at the very bottom there, the one by Proven and Millward, that's the one that I would direct you to um, first off. Um, but I actually, I don't, I don't know if this is the right time for it, but there's, I, I do want to put it out there, that there's some controversy over this consideration. And so this is something um, that I, I don't think we should get too much into, but if you're interested in having a discussion about this, feel free to follow up with Danielle or me. Um, but this idea of having a central coordinating entity has been shown to be really important in some instances, but in others, um, there is there's speculation that it could actually be detrimental. And so there's, there's actually an article that Danielle wrote last year 
that speaks to this, but I wonder if we could share that out in the follow-up. Yeah, and we'll share it out after. And um, Stephanie's right, we could go down a rabbit hole here. <laughs> so I'm just gonna mention um, the idea, one reason why I love network science, because I'm a big geek too, um, besides that I'm a big geek, is that we were, Martin was talking about this yesterday, it's, there are so many intuitive contradictions right inside the science. Um, what I mean by that is the, the way that we like to build networks is almost always with the assumption that more is better or more central is better and all of those things. But then there's theories in network science that will immediately tell you why that's all wrong, why you can um, overload a node um, in your network with too many ties and therefore it becomes a really weak and vulnerable um, place. And so it's contradictory, but when we talk about it, it's so intuitive. Like you just know this, that if you're in practice doing this work, it won't surprise you that there's probably um, nuances to the fact that a coordinating agency might not always be right. Um, and what Stephanie's referring to is a, a piece I wrote in a nonprofit quarterly um, called Our Backbone Organizations Eroding the Norms That Make Networks Succeed. Um, so my thoughts on, on that, but there's definitely space for this. And I last just wanted to say, um, I really think this topic is like the topic of networks for 2019, yeah. is what is the right network structure? Since uh, Collective Impact was so popular and backbone organizations became um, so as so much the go-to way to structure networks, I think a few years into it, people are really starting to ask questions like, is this the right approach and what are the alternatives? So I know at the NLTA, we have a whole session um, just on this topic because we think people are really um, working through this in their communities right now trying to answer these questions. So lots there. I will just say that yeah. my guess, mm -hmm. unfortunately for all of us, is that there's no one right way. No. That this is where, you know, you need to go back to what Danielle always says is, you know, that what's right for one network may not be right for another network. And so this this topic for 2019, I, I'm afraid, will be much more complicated than many of us research, researchers would like for it to be. Although that's yeah. what makes it fun. That's why it's fun. <laughs> so two quick comments. One said, um, thanks, another ACH on the line here. And someone else said, great presentation, very informative and beginner friendly. Thank you guys <laughs> for those nice comments. Thank you. Okay, so a couple of other questions. So let me go back to the first few that were there. Okay, how uh, can folks access your questionnaire? Yes, absolutely. I actually have an example of it here. But I can, um, so we'll be sending this slide set out after this webinar. And so um, I can include the entire survey if you all want, but, um, but here's just a quick example of what that looks like. Okay, yeah, and afterwards Melinda will send out, send out other resources as well that are mentioned on the call, and also we post them online with the video of the webinar. Um, okay, so this one asks, how did you define representation by race, ethnicity, gender, age? Yeah, so for, for the purposes of this study, remember we're looking at the organization as the unit of analysis, and so a negative aspect of that is that it glosses over a lot of this population level stuff, a lot of the, the demographic composition of the, um, of say like the, the geographic service areas, the sectors. Um, and so that is something that I know Better Health Together and Spokane Regional Health District are super cognizant about. I mean, they um, have gone so far as to create a regional, um, a regional community health assessment. So this is something that informs all of their actions, all of their decisions. For the purposes of this study, that's actually not something that was a center of this study, again, because we're looking at the organization as the unit of analysis. And so when we look at um, representation when it comes to organizations, we are really looking at demographic characteristics of organizations, which could be geographic service area, sector, um, you know, the target population that they serve, what their strategic focus areas are, things like that. So it actually looks quite a lot different than maybe a um, community health assessment would when we look at representation. 
Um, okay, so a question on your graphics. Your graphics are awesome. Thank you. Um, can I ask how you're able to integrate the data with the visual representation, for example, illustrating network geographic representation on the map of Washington State? Yeah, absolutely. So that, um, when we first did that, I worked with one of my brilliant coworkers at SHD, um, Amy Rice. She um, was an ArcGIS whiz, and I was beginning to be a network analysis whiz, and we um, put our heads together and figured out how to integrate that network output with ArcGIS. And so essentially that turned into um, a, a multi-step process that involves integrating diverse data files and having to know how to do a lot on both ends. Uh, and I, um, and so, uh, and I will, I will call him out. It's um, Dylan who has done one of our webinars before, um, and an, uh, also an awesome network leader. <laughs> uh, we, so we can. Um, and I'm just going to plug for a second that because um, Stephanie came and taught us that long journey of how to do that, um, it's something that um, when I said she upped our game, it was something that we've been able to use. Um, so I encourage you all to, to check it out because it really makes great understanding of the maps um, even better. Um, and we're building our data dashboards in Aspen now, and we're adding the feature of the GIS mapping the maps onto it. So hopefully we're going to make that journey, um, a, make a big shortcut in it. But um, uh, it, it, and it, one thing we should say, it requires when you load in your list of folks you want to include in the survey, you have to load um, their address. Or you know, the latitude and longitude. The latitude and longitude. There's a whole extra like layer of data that you have to make sure to yeah. collect. And when you have say thousands of organizations or whatever you want to geospatially orient, it can yeah, it adds to the journey. Yeah. <laughs> so do it early. Like yeah. know it know it early because going backwards, we we all know the pain. Yep. Um, okay. So we still have time, and we have um, two questions here um, from Serena Kim. So the first one are the sectors. So public social health education business mutually exclusive, would an or could an organization fall into more than one category? Yes. Um, Serena, that is a great question and something that um, there's definitely room for improvement on. So those sectors are sectors that um, we, so the, the data center and Better Health Together worked closely on to figure out what made the most sense for our region and our organizational landscape. So I wouldn't even go so far to say as those sector categories that we created um, would be appropriate for every region. One of the challenges that we definitely ran into, um, it actually wasn't as big a challenge as I was worried it could have been, is that they're not mutually exclusive. So public health, for example, fits into both the public sector and the health sector. We addressed this a little bit by um, being really careful with our wording on the survey, as well as providing some examples of which types of organizations fit in, into which sector. Um, but that is definitely, you know, something that if, if we can figure out a better way to do it, I would be very open to ideas on that. So Serena, if you have ideas, I would love to hear them. And this is another thing we've just grappled with on our team for ages now, and, and Stephanie and I, even on different projects, trying to come up with a list, and sometimes you want to match it to like a social determinants of health framework, yeah. and even that was not easy when we tried to do that. Um, when people log in now to our Aspen platform and they fill out a, their profile, we have a drop down of organization type or function. I think we called it organization mm -hmm. function. I think we got it down to like 35 yeah. <laughs> or something because we were like, you know, we did like the journey of an organization filling out their, their profile and, and trying to pick, you know, it, we, it just became really hard. But so we decided we would over collect on the organization type because we could collapse them later. Yeah. So that that's been one way. But um, yeah, if you want to if you want to see our what we came up with, and I'm not kidding, iteration after iteration of projects and pushing and looking at what other people have done. If you everyone on here can go in and log on with their app and um, flat, just log in on our website, and you'll see the list drop down. 
So, but that one is going to be the opposite of this one. Yep. It's the everything. <laughs> and here we are going for simple, straightforward, yeah. minimize, yes. respondent burden to the extent yeah. possible. Well, and it's really hard to analyze a longer list. Exactly. Uh, as the list gets longer. <laughs> yeah, you can't, you can't make these nice categories mm -hmm. of visuals either. Okay, the other question from Trina, how did you measure capacity? Um, oh wait, you you mentioned capacity of networks, or maybe it was of organizations. How did you measure capacity? What does capacity include? For example, is it financial resources, human capacity, expertise, information, political resources, political support? These are all really good examples. Yeah, those are great examples. Um, yeah. yeah. So, um, so capacity was not actually a focus of this study. Um, if we were to look at organizational capacity, which Serena, as a resource-dependent scholar, you know probably way more about this than I do or may ever know. Um, but as as you um, as you know, some of the the ways that we could potentially look at capacity at the organizational level are looking at what kinds of resources do they have available to them. Um, like, what is their staff size? What is their annual operating budget? Um, these types of things. But I'm wondering, um, Danielle has actually done some really cool work looking at, um, I believe it's nonprofit carrying capacity. Mm -hmm. And so looking at this question of how do you measure the capacity of an organization and a system broadly? Um, so Danielle actually may be better suited to answer this question than I am since this was, capacity was not a specific focus of this study. Oh, I wasn't thinking about that when you were talking. Um, <laughs> So our team has a project from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation on um, just measuring the carrying capacity of the nonprofit and public sector to absorb referrals from health systems and, and clinics. So as people are doing more and more screening on social determinants of health um, with the thought that if they refer people to social services, um, resources in the community, we can improve people's health and wellness. That's a great plan, and it's so exciting that hospitals and health systems are on board with that, but the idea that we're just gonna refer out to the nonprofit and public sector um, isn't really the best strategy without understanding the capacity of that sector to absorb those resources. So we've been engaging with a couple of communities on really trying to understand this, and um, so Serena, without going into too much detail, we started with the kinds of things like financial resources, human capacity, um, the kinds of measurable things, um, even by looking at folks' 990s and trying to understand how they report their resources. And we've got this awesome economist on our team, budget guy, who can think about um, reserves and stuff like that. But what we're really trying to add to that measure is a measure of um, um, collabor collaboration, you know, network strength. Um, you mentioned leadership, or maybe expertise. Leadership for us is one kind of buy-in. These more abstract, hard to measure things as measures of capacity um, and perceptions. Uh, I think the whole study of networks is this, uh, one of the best, best things that you can get out of all this data is the perceptions that people have of each other. Perceptions of capacity compared to actual capacity is so interesting, um, and things like that. So. Stay tuned for that because we're working on a little tool that uh, communities can use that can, um, uh, everything with the ends of the tool, I think, but uh, can end, um, can, people can input both the, the measurable and hard to measure thing. I can say, I think the thing I love best about networks and me this kind of measurement is, uh, measurement is measuring the things that other people don't want to tackle, yeah. like social <laughs> connectedness and perceptions of trust and value. Or so. the things other people don't think it's possible to measure. Yeah. Like love. Yeah. <laughs> um, we so um, we will. That's from another project. Yeah. Um, so we're just at the top of the hour, and um, if you have other questions, um, Stephanie's email is on the slides. Um, she's an open, lovely person to learn from. Um, we hope you'll stay connected with us. Um, at Visible Network Labs. We're going to have a community forum up pretty soon, a place where you can go and do these kinds of discussions right on the website. And we hope that you will join us. Um, so thank you everyone for, for joining today um, and all of the great feedback that you all are, are sending over the chat. That always feels really good. <laughs> um, so, so stay in touch. Um, have a great rest of your week. And we are um, signing off now. So thank you and goodbye.